The scene starts as MC is shocked that he has to go to a fishing event tomorrow. MC answers that he has never fished before and doesn't have the gear for it. Our MC is introduced as Sonata Shiru. His superior says that if he doesn't have it, he should get it at his own expense. MC asks if tomorrow is Sunday, earning him a glare. After some time, as he departs, MC is regretting that what an utterly despicable black company. No matter how hard he tries, no one is pleased, and no one rewards him. This pay is underwhelming. He thinks that he will have to find another job after all. It would be nice if his next person appreciated him. He decides that he will go to bed early. As he's walking, he disappears into thin air. As our MC realizes himself in front of a huge, colossal castle, he is shocked that it is a foreign country. And why is he in a place like this? He thinks that isn't the thing, where one dies in one sleep due to an overheating stroke. And is he being reincarnated into another world? The MC jogs the question, saying that's wrong, and after that, he will wake up in the morning and meet up with his boss and the participants. And then, when he got on the boat and started fishing, he caught a flounder, and that flounder talked to him. Then suddenly, a black hole in the sky, in the sea, opened and sucked him in. MC realizes that, so it is another world. MC shoves they doesn't know for sure. As he tries to examine things through the castle, he thinks that it might be a foreign country after all. As he barely evades a spear shot at him by a group of soldiers who apprehend him, they shout at him that martial law has been declared, and is he a collaborator of the royal family? MC, shockingly, hesitates to say that he doesn't get it and that he's just an employee of a black company. As the soldier smiles down, saying that he's a valuable man and, of course, they won't kill him, as she enjoys it with his companion, she unsheathes her helmet. The girl says that they won't kill him, so he will relax, but that depends on whether or not he satisfies them. As they apprehend MC, saying that he is coming with them, MC thinks that it might be the case when he heard their voices, but these people are all women. MC thinks that all is right, he will just find an opening and run away. He pulls his arm but is unable to unapprehend him. As he notices, the girl in front of her is too strong. As the girl says, did he just try to escape? As she chokes his wrist, MC thinks that this is the strength of a movement, and he can't shake it off. The scene shifts into the prison as a girl clothless out there orders him to lick it, as the other women are also excited about it, thinking that this guy's hair smells so good and it's like a flower. As they bicker with each other, they know that they are next. As the girl in front of her says, just get on with the licking and do it like a dog. As she pushes MC to do it, MC thinks that, come to think of it, the protective gear smells a lot. Maybe armor gets pretty stuffy, and he wonders if that's it, what is unique. As he vomits on her crotch, her companions are scared that he has dirtied it with vomit. The captain kicks MC, sending him flying back, grieving in pain. She claims she went easy on him as she choked on her anger, vowing to violate him until he cried and begged for forgiveness. MC, still without clothes and unrested, hears her comment on his face and body. As he is tied to the bench, he thinks they can say what they want, recalling how he used to make similar comments in middle school. He apologizes to a former classmate, Yashida, realizing the hurtfulness of his words. The captain comments on his appearance and promises to use magic repeatedly until she's satisfied. MC wonders if he could return to his world, surprised by the mention of magic. The magician, casting a spell, grabs MC's head, declaring, this is where the fun begins. As MC's little Joe gets excited, the captain says, looks like they're all set, as MC is crying, questioning if this is a power of magic, and all he can do is stare because that flounder brought him to this kind of world. As a voice shouts to them, what are they doing? What is this deal with the man? As the captain tries to escape from the situation, saying she was wandering around the castle courtyard, they apprehend him, and they are about to start the interrogation. The official asks, what interrogation? What about the patrol? As she orders them to get back to their posts, the official asks MC to get dressed. She welcomes Princess Christia there. MC is mesmerized thinking that such an important person is like this, and she looks quite beautiful and dignified. Her hair shines as if intermingled with light, and he's sure that she is normally a refined lady with typical rich girl vibes. As he looks upon her chest, Thinking that otherworldly cleavage is there too, the princess asks the official, how dare she confine a member of the family to a place like this, as MC thinks she's a feisty one. The official says, on the contrary, it would be rude to put the warrior princess of Regalsha under house arrest, and they have to take every precaution. As the princess says that the eastern garrison is still going and not to think this is the end, the official says she's still bitter after the fall of the royal capital. As Christia says, if only General Hassan had not betrayed us, for which the official says, until the execution in three days, those handcuffs are just fine. And she should ask that man for help with her necessities in this time of misery. Perhaps he will be able to find comfort with him. As MC shouts that they're not letting him go after some time, 
The princess asks why things are not going their way, for which MC says it looks like a tough situation, flinching the princess. As MC asks what happens if he asks, the princess says, addressing her directly, well, he's a captive princess, there's no point in bringing up her social status. MC asks some questions and asks where they are, for which Christia says they are in prison, dumbfounded, as MC says it is obvious. Christia explains that they are in Regalta, the royal capital of the kingdom of Regalsha, as she asks if he was perhaps brought here by someone else, as MC thinks he was brought here, or rather, he was sent here, as he confesses that the truth is he is not someone from this world, as he introduces himself as Sonata and explains his despairing suffering, that he rubbed his sleepy eyes, then reboarded the fishing boat, and while fighting seasickness, he caught a fish and that he drowned. As Christian realizes this, she gives MC a big hug with her cleavage, as the princess consoles him, saying that he's so passionately narrating such a fantasy as if it were real. He must have had an exceedingly awful experience, or perhaps he was a child with not much between the ears in the first place. As MC thinks this is a world where magic exists, he thought she would believe him. As the princess says, this is a lovely outfit he has, and the son of the family must be a respectable one. It's no wonder that this conflict would affect him mentally and he should stay calm until he stays calm. As MC is delighted that he gets to remain there, he thinks that she might be hot-tempered, but that said, he doesn't know how he feels about being treated like a pitiful child. Christia says, is he embarrassed? He's quite a sweetheart, as she asks him to rest easy, as she will not do anything like force herself onto him. As MC is quite embarrassed, he wouldn't mind doing it with her, and he doesn't mind if she messes up with him. As he is drooling, MC asks himself why he is excited and it isn't about the situation right now, what he needs is information. MC asks if there are men here, as he hasn't seen a single one since arriving in this country. Christia says they are currently in wartime, and she believes that they are hiding because otherwise, they would be abducted by imperial soldiers, just like he is. MC asks if there are no male soldiers, to which Christia says that men cannot be soldiers, and if he doesn't even know that. Take note that theirs is a country that employs women as soldiers, leaving MC worried about whether he would be able to survive in this world. The scene shifts into the past as MC, employed by a black company, is at a fishing event on a day off ordered by his boss. As MC is suffering, he catches a fish and hears it calling for help. Scared, he throws it away, realizing he's the first one to catch the guests. The fish, delighted by his honesty, decides to grant one of his wishes. MC believes that a wish like becoming crafty and being able to make all kinds of things sounds easy. The fish realizes that what he desires is creation magic, as he calls MC's name. MC is shocked that the fish knows his name and what creation magic is. A black hole summons him between the rivers, swallowing him into it and transporting him to another world. He's shocked to realize it's a world where women are overwhelmingly dominant. MC thinks, but didn't the flounder give him magic? And he's a man. Prince Christia asks where he came from, and MC answers, from a country called Japan. Prince Christia apologizes, saying it must be too difficult for him. MC explains that Japan is an island country surrounded by the sea with a population of approximately 126 million and an economic powerhouse with advanced industry, science, and technology. Christia is amazed, noting Japan has more than three times the population of the empire and finding MC's stories amusing. She thanks him, saying there are three days left until her execution, and she's glad to spend them together with him. She explains that he will not be killed but enslaved and presented to the nobility or sent to the frontier as a pioneer. As MC asks if she can use magic to escape for she explains that her handcuffs seal off magic, and she cannot even use physical strength. MC asks if they could remove the handcuffs to elude their pursuit, but Christia says escape is difficult due to allowing the Empire to invade. She asks for forgiveness, but MC reassures her that it's not her mistake, those to blame are those who captured him. MC realizes the flounder might be able to help her if he can use magic. He asks what kind of process using magic consists of. And Christia explains that the young ones begin by deeply introspecting and gazing at their own characters. MC decides to gaze calmly into himself, calling upon the flounder. He closes his eyes to meditate, wondering if he should yell status open or something. When he opens his eyes, he sees a status window in front of him, shocked to realize it really open. This is the creation magic he was given, the flounder's words weren't a lie. He wonders if he can make something like a panacea but is shocked to see the production time is 247 years. As he thinks that he will be long dead when he's done, Christia asks what he's doing. MC says, Princess, look at this, but Christia is unable to look at it. She moves through it. MC says it looks like he can use magic too. Christia sympathizes with him, thinking he's a pitiful man, unable to fathom his uselessness, and hugs him down. Christia orders him to stop the foolishness, asking how a man can use magic. 
She understands his desire to turn away from reality but tells him to pull himself together. As MC is crunched in her chest, he thinks it's so soft. But with the way things are going, maybe it will end up with her having her way with him. Christian says if he calms down, she'll lay down too, and they'll rest as she sleeps down. MC thinks that she's a gentle woman and will be fair to her until they meet again. He realizes he has to look into his magic while he can. From what he's read, water magic seems like the easiest thing he can do, with a production time of 30 minutes. This seems like it can be shortened by leveling up. Let's just give it a try. MC meditates to become aware of his inner self, feeling his pulse and breathing. He doesn't know any spells, can he do it instinctively? He chants to activate creation magic, and a timer starts. MC thinks it started and looks towards his vomit, realizing it's still there and the smell is getting bad. He decides to use a bucket as a toilet. Confused, he wonders if this prison is too unsanitary. He thinks about vaccines or antibiotics. Using penicillin takes 47 years. Once the water is done, he could make a rag or mop. With a production time of 6 hours, MC decides to undress his pants, wondering why he's doing so. He wonders if it will be treated as a maritime accident. Maybe he won't be covered by insurance. He cries, thinking about his worried parents and whether he'll be able to go back to his work world. Christian wakes up, sees MC shaking, and asks why he's crying. MC tries to dodge the question, saying it's not an act, but is surprised as Christia hugs him, saying he's so cute. She tries to comfort him as death blooms over him. MC realizes that's how she interprets it. Christia says if he dislikes it enough to cry, there's no need to exert himself. MC says he's not pushing himself and feels sorry for her. Christia is touched, saying he's really adorable. She says she has experience dealing with men and puts her arm into his clothes. Mesmerized that MC can't believe that he would let a woman take care of him like this. As Christia asks him to turn, saying it's a little too tight and could he open it for him. Just as the water production time completes, MC says, what is this? Hold on a second, they are going for a good part. Christia asks if he doesn't like the chest. This needs to be frustrated, and is he holding his back? She says how much she thinks of him, and he may be down there as well. MC tries to go to the good part, as the status bar warns to specify the place of appearance. As he decides that he will get it over with, he looks towards another place to summon the water after some time. As he's laid down, he thinks that he needs a container when making water. But right now, forget about magic, let's focus on this. MC realizes that it's like her switch has been flipped, as Christia is quite in the mood, as they both get laid down. After that, Christia says that she told MC he did great and asked him to call her Christia. Now, she supposes she has no regrets in this world. MC notices that she's sleeping, and he wakes up thinking that she is totally treating him like a mistress. No, mistresses. He can't help but become attached when she puts on skin. In three days, she will be executed, and that's the last thing he wants. If he could remove those handcuffs, he's sure that they could get a lot done. The next night in prison, Christia asks MC to move away from the bunk. She crunches down the bench to make out a shop corner of it. MC thinks that she can do something like that even with her power seal. As MC asks what's going on all of a sudden, Christia says that perhaps it was sleeping with him that made her not want to give up until the end. Embarrassing MC. Christia says she planned to use this to savor her wrist. MC is dumbfounded by this. Christia says she will be able to use magic if she removes the handcuffs. She may not be able to use healing magic, but she can cauterize the wound with fire magic and stop the bleeding. She will destroy as much bone as possible with the first blow and then she'll need him to tear off the remaining flesh and skin. MC is shivering at just the thought of it. He stops her, saying, Please don't be hasty, as he will definitely get rid of the handcuffs. He notices that the production time is 1 hour and 55 minutes, shivering at about 2 hours until the thing is completed. He blurts out that he can do it using magic abilities. Christia says not to use such nonsense again, as if a man could use magic. MC begs her to wait just 1 hour. 54 minutes and 34 seconds. Seeing this, Christia is convinced, saying that either way they should make their escape in the middle of the night, and once two hours pass, he will have to assist with her plan. After two hours, Christa says that the time will soon be over, for which MC says not yet, and there are another 27 minutes. Christia asks how he knows without hearing the bells, for which MC says he can actually tell the time accurately with this watch too, showing her his wristwatch. Christia bangs upon the corner, saying no more, and stealing herself to keep it in place. She clenches her wrist to save her arm, as MC shouts for her to please just wait and asks what he can do to get her to wait for another 27 minutes. Christia says this is the only way now. MC asks her to have faith in him as he asks to be late again. Christia is shocked to hear what he just said, asking what he's saying, as this is hardly the time. MC says he's scared of tearing off her wrist, asking her to give him courage. Seeing his determination, Christia opens her chest, saying that she will give him strength. 
MC thinks that, unexpectedly, it is a great success in his mission. Afterward, Krishna says that a bunk ended up broken, and will he mind being on the ground, for which MC says that the stone is cold. Krishna says she will keep him warm. MC realizes that she's warm, noticing that she's being way too forceful, and at this pace, it will be over in no time. He holds it for dear life until 22 minutes, keeping it up for another 22 minutes. MC thinks that what a coincidence it's done at the same time, as Krishna asks if this is enough and it's time to get ready. She's feeling quite scared. As MC says, please, look at this, he disdainfully looks at the palm of his hands as the place of appearance. He summons a cutter. Seeing this, Krishna is shocked as she notices it's a file, suddenly appearing thin. MC thinks she is dumbfounded. To tell the truth, he has been working on a file since yesterday with his creation magic. He took the iron bar that was made into material, which disappeared from the window grill. MC says he made it to cut off the handcuffs and asks what she thinks about his creation magic. Krishna can't believe her eyes as she asks if he has a plan. MC blandly declines it, saying just a bit more, and asks her to try pulling the chain as he cuts it down. As she crunches down the chains, Krishna feels her aura throughout her body, saying the magic resist effect wore off. She compliments MC as she destroys the chains and apprehends the guards. Krishna says it's a sleeping mist and they will not awaken until the morning. She asks MC to move aside as she punches upon the bench to break it open, leaving MC impressed as she confirms that her physical strength works as usual and they are leaving now. She flies out to crunch down the bars. MC praises her, saying it's incredible. Christia is delighted that not many have this kind of magic. She jumps onto the window and rescues MC with a single hand. MC is finally relieved that he's finally outdoors. They are hiding, thinking it's not too late, but he wonders if it's a good idea to follow her. Krishna goes directly to a chapel, and there's a secret passage underground that leads out of the castle. She will take care of the guards, and he has to wait for her. As she dashes towards it to destroy the soldiers, MC thinks maybe he should have stayed in prison. But remembering the zombie girls in the prison, he shakes off the decision, thinking he would probably be worse off if he stayed. As he runs, thinking he will go with her, he enters the passage. Krishna says the passage leads to the pedestal of a bronze statue in Monson Park, and from there, they will head for the Philap Fishing Harbor. MC thinks that he is lost there, nodding his head as he's directed, as in the end he is left quite saddened that he's directed to the sea again. The next day, as MC is having quite a lot of fantasies about Krishna, he wakes up to realize he is in a boat. He realizes that they were swept here. No matter where he looks, there is only the sea. After escaping the castle through the underground passage, they were spotted several times by Imperial soldiers once they arrived at the fishing harbor, but Krishna warded them off like a demon each time. They hijacked a fisherman's boat and set sail at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. MC praises her, saying that's her, and she is so skilled at handling the boat, for which Krishna giggles at him. In the present, MC thinks that the current carried them away, and here they are. When she said that they were going to steal a boat, he assumed that she could handle it, but there's nothing they can do about it. He sees a panel and realizes that the water is done, so he puts it into the pot. He thinks that water can be made in 5 minutes from sea waters, so they can prevent dehydration. It also consumes 2 MP, but the experience gained is limited. He compliments that, thanks to the file and pot, the tool category is the one with the most experience, and next time he will try to make bread. He is delighted that the MP doesn't recover while production is ongoing, but it recovers at a rate of 1 per minute when not using magic. He thinks that he is getting the hang of it and looks like he will be leveling up soon, making things that will be useful in his daily life. MC gives the water to Krishna, for which she says that it looks like they will be able to survive thanks to him, and he must be her guardian angel. MC is quite embarrassed. There is no way he would be a guardian angel for her. As he thinks that he's starting to feel less uncomfortable with her treating him like a cute, Krishna shouts that there is an island, and she can see an island. MC shouts, asking where it is, as he can't see it. Krishna bolts through the boat, saying there is definitely something over there. MC notices that it really is an island as they reach a huge island on the seaside. As they are lying down, MC says that it's a true tropical paradise. Krista jumps upon a tree to take out a fruit, easily landing on a huge tree. She says that although he has creation magic, securing food is fundamental to survival. MC can't believe there is still the same absurd physical ability. After some time, Krista says that they would scout the surrounding area. If there are any inhabitants, they could ask where they are, and if this is a deserted island, they could expect heinous monsters to be around. MC is quite worried, so this is a world with those two after all. He sees a slime, shocked that this could be a slime, for which Krishna asks if it's his first time seeing it. MC says he has seen them in games, trying to dodge the question, saying that he has seen them in paintings. He asks if that's not dangerous, to which Krishna says if he gets close, it can be. 
It can cover him with its digestive fluids, causing tingling and skin irritation if not washed away right away. MC realizes how threatening it is, as Christia says that slimes are benign monsters, eating and decomposing human excrement and garbage, which is why he must not kill them indiscriminately. MC thought maybe she could go around the entire island if she walked along the coast, but the forest extends to the shore. Christia asks MC to get up on her back as she hops on trees easily with MC carrying on her back. MC shouts, asking if they can't just walk on the road, for which Christia says it's faster this way. MC is having quite a difficult time as he's being thrashed by a branch of the tree. As Christia says, it is what happens when he is letting her go, MC crunches upon her. Christia smiles, saying it is too early in the day to relax as MC is holding her watermelon. MC is quite blessed by this incident. After some time, MC says that they got out of the forest, and there is a dense thicket. Christia asks him to step back as she slashes down the ground with the wind cutter. MC says that this is another first for him, as they see a cliff. Christia carries him out as MC thinks that she's jumping while carrying him like this and climbing up a cliff without breaking a sweat, as magic really is a cheating skill after all. After some time, MC realizes that they spent half a day around the island, and putting it all together, it looks like this, he draws out a map. Christia asks if he would like to eat the fruits they collected during the investigation, as she is hungry. MC presents it, saying, in that case, please have this. He presents a bread too. Christia asks if he made this too with creation magic, for which MC makes a cute face, saying yes, it's his first time, so he can't make promises regarding the taste, but he worked hard for it. He thinks that he gave the cute, hardworking boy roll a try. Christia is taken aback by his cuteness, saying that once they are done eating, they are off to explore the mountain, to which he agrees. As they are exploring, Christia says that it might be handy to have a cave around here, a reasonable distance from the river, so it could prove to be convenient as far as access to water goes. MC says that there isn't any convenient cave, for which Christia says it's easy, they just have to make one. She phases through the cliff to make one. MC, not getting used to this absurdity, says that he is going back to the beach to get water and food, for which she agrees. As MC is carrying down the food, he is having quite a difficult time. Thinking, is that magic amazing, or is it Christia? As he reaches Christia, she says that it was fast, and she's also done with this. She shows him a quite luxurious castle-like room, asking what he thinks about it, thinking this much space will be enough. MC shouts that this is more than enough and that she made a table, chairs, and bed out of stone, for which Christia gets embarrassed, saying that while she was at it, she did it at night. MC asks what she plans on doing moving forward for which Christa says that they discussed it on the board and she thinks they were swept away towards the southeast. Therefore, if they go towards the east, land should come into view. They will join the border garrison at Bowanda Castle. And the latest information she has is that Bowanda Citadel troops dealt a heavy blow to the Imperial Army and forced it to retreat. They are in a combat situation, but right now, it's safe to say that a standoff is going on. She says that they have fertile fields within the sturdy walls and stockpile that will last 10 years and if they go there, they will definitely be well. MC thinks that someone as strong as Christia is saying this, so he's sure that it will be fine, but he is worried. The next day, as Christia leaves, she says that while she is gathering the palm fronds, she will take the chance to look around the river for animals they could eat. She smiles down, asking that he needs more than fruit to stay energetic. In the forest, MC says that he will look for plants and materials to make bags where they can put what they harvest. MC realizes that since he found some vines, once the bread he is currently making is done, he will get 6 EXP, and after that, if he makes the harvesting bag, just a bit more until he is level 1. MC thinks that once he is able to make even more things, eventually he will do it. MC realizes that, eventually, as MC gets back, Christia welcomes him, saying that with this, they can sleep soundly tonight. As MC thinks that there is only a bed and she planned to sleep together from the beginning, MC says that now this is a proper bed, not like in the prison, for which Christia says that she is quite proud of it. By the way, about what they will do, he's interrupted by Christia saying that she failed to hunt anything outstanding, and she made him expect meat for dinner as she apologizes. She says that once they escape this island, fighting is probably inevitable. They need to remain vigorous tomorrow, as she will definitely do it. MC asks her to please leave him here with a straight face, as Christia is shocked by hearing this, and she asks what he is seeing, to which MC replies that he is useless in a fight and he will only get in her way. He thinks that Christia is certainly strong, but even with their strength, she was captured once, and if she has to look after him, then at some point she will be detained again. MC explains that if his magic levels up, he might be able to eventually make a high-performance boat or even other things that could be useful in battle, but that will be eventually, and she's in a hurry, isn't it? It will be fine, and he can make the essential things with magic, so please don't look back and set off towards the east. 
Christian is about to cry as she hugs down MC, asking for forgiveness, for which MC in turn hugs her. As they are done doing this thing again, Christia says that MC has become quite bold, and that surprised her, for which MC is quite embarrassed, saying that all thanks to her guidance, his technique has come a long way in the last few days. Christia mentions that she has never heard of a man taking the initiative, using even his hands and mouth. A man who is chased by a day and a hustler by night is a man to be pleased with. As MC makes a sound, Christia asks, for which MC says that he just finished making the harvesting bag as he casts up as a light glows. MC delightfully says that he has leveled up but is quite disappointed to see his status down, as he thinks that his MP increases now that he can do things he didn't have enough of before, but the rest remains unchanged. MC says that the planned six loaves of bread for breakfast are about to become nine, which surprises Christia, prasizing that this is quite the way to start the day. She says that there is no need to be in a rush, although she supposes it does not level up as rapidly as in bed, making MC embarrassed as they laugh it off. MC says that tomorrow will be a long day, and shall they go to bed? The next day, as MC is collecting the fruits, he says that this much is enough and they don't even know how far away this place is from land, and he guesses she should have enough water and food to last her for a week, assuming she needs at least 2 liters of water per day. They would need four water jugs. As he collects that, he's worried that one thing he learned while gathering the food is that a knife is essential, but he still doesn't have enough amp to make a knife. As he takes in the room, he picks up a chipper stone knife, thinking that to improve usability, let's change its class to a Polish stone. Suddenly, Christia comes, bringing a big boar monster, mm -hmm. saying that she brought it down with a magic arrow, but she does not know how to take it apart. She says that she drained the blood for the time being, for which MC thinks that she's a princess, she doesn't know how to. He says that when it comes to fish, he can manage, and as Christia suggests, they give it a try on their own. She slashes down the boar as MC notices the skin and the organs, and he can see it. Christia says that it's a good point, and she dismantles it. MC says that with this, no amount of salt will be enough, and he was wondering if it could be preserved by smoking it. As they smoke the boar, MC thinks that he had Christia cut a fallen tree, and they made a box for it easily. He also had her use her fire magic. And he said he would be fine, but he thinks he's going to have a hard time alone at night, as they again have fun. MC thinks that she's more intense than usual, and it's like she is trying to take all of him. MC asks her for a rest, saying this as he makes her lie down. She says that this is a truly fresh view, for which MC says to try moving as she fits, as he will just do that after having fun. The next day, as MC is helping Christia board the boat with essentials, she says that here they are. By the way, is he alright? Last night he seemed to have run off steam, embarrassing MC and blurring that he's okay. Christia says that this was her first time having a man on top of her, but it was not bad, and he was adorable working so hard, for which MC retorts that to stop it, and that's not what to say at a time like this. MC smiles down, saying that he wishes her the best of luck, for which Christia asks him to take care, and she would have gladly taken him as a concubine, for which MC waves her thinking that he's not sure about joining the harem as she departs and disappears into the huge sea. MC thinks that now he will have to make a flint to start fires on his own, as well as a pot, fishing rod, mirror, soap, riser, and riser. Let's keep it going and level up quickly. Then he's sure that he will be able to do it, but he realizes that he guesses he will be alone until then. The scene shifts as MC sees Krista lying faint down the seashore. He asks her if she's back already and not to tell him about the shipwreck. Christia says that it isn't like that, she wanted to see him, so she quickly defeated the empire, restored the kingdom, and then the very same day, she swam back here. She entrusted the kingdom to someone else and let them build their own on this island. As she's starving, she suggests they have some starfish soup and asks if he would rather start with that, as he is a handful. MC is delighted that he guesses it's because she's fresh out of water, she feels so soggy today, but he realizes that he's grinning, the slime out, as the slime spits on him. MC is scared that he has to wash it off or his skin will peel off. As he washes his face, he realizes that it was a dream, as Krista isn't here anymore, and he's alone on this island. He has a bonfire set up by Krista's sword, which Krista took from a pursuing soldier at the fishing harbor. MC is scared that he needs to stop being overly conscious of the fact that he relied on Krista for a lot of things. Besides, he is making flint right now. Maybe he should have built a door for the entrance first. But if that sort of animal thing attacked him, he would stand no chance. The flint takes about 8 hours, and he doesn't have the courage to enter the forest at night to gather wood for the door, as the sword is too heavy for him to swing it. Every night is going to be like this. As MC's brain works for a while and an idea glows up, the next morning, as he's tired, he thinks that he knows that in the end he was so scared that he didn't sleep until morning. The timer is done, and he thinks that he has to get prepared so that starting tonight, he can sleep in peace. He has made a spear, thinking that he did a splendid job, as he thinks that if a sword is heavy, just turn it into a spear. 
He will carry this as a walking stick when he goes to the forest. There is one more pending issue as he goes into the forest, thinking that he wonders if a growing tree works as a material. But as he casts his spell to make a log of the tree disappear to make the tree fall off, MC thinks that from now on, it will take a bit more distance before turning trees into materials. As the preparation is ready, he summons the cedar door to cover the entrance. Eventually, he has to make a better one, as he is having a quite difficult time opening and closing it. On walking the seashore, MC thinks that he hasn't had rice in a while. As he gets some, he realizes that he needs at least 200 grams of cooked rice, and he has to wait two hours. He realizes that there is something lying over the seashore, and it looks like a kombu. He thinks that he has to try boiling it so he can make some dashi. If so, tonight he gets delighted that he will get on a jiri and kombu clear soup. Speaking of which, he thinks he misses miso soup too, and he feels like he hasn't had any in a long time. He thinks that Japan is far away. Five days later, MC is giggling to himself as he thinks that a bit more, and he almost done with that thing he has been waiting for. In the three days following Christian's departure, he made all kinds of things, and finally, the creation magic has reached the third level. Not just more MP bonuses. At last, that category was unlocked, and he immediately began making it for another 48 hours. He can't stand the solitude anymore as he summons his loyal servant, a stone golem mass production type. As the golem turns around, MC thinks that he imagined it would look tougher. Actually, it's a little bit cute. He's delighted that it looks cuter than the statues. Its eyes occasionally glow green. On top of that, it can lift things weighing up to 500 kgs. For its name, it can be OI, and it sounds cursed. He thinks that it just seems masculine. From today onwards, his name is Iwao. The golem is happy and shows it by raising his fist. MC asks it to show him the caravan they live in, and he will show him around the island too. As Iwao is following him around, MC thinks that Iwao doesn't say much, but he is glad that he has someone to talk to on the seashore. He tells Iwa that this is the East Coast and to remember this. MC thinks that it has been around a week since he came to this world, and he's becoming familiar with the view from here. He's living a completely different life than in Japan. As he tells Iwa that he has done his research and knows quite a bit about the island, if there is something he doesn't understand or he is curious about, let him know. Iwa nods his head and moves away. He points towards a tree, and MC says that it is a forest and does did the forest catch his attention. As he is pointing continuously towards it, MC realizes that it is the depth of the forest on the other side. He says that it looks like the south side of the island, but this forest is too deep to walk through. On the other hand, going around on a boat or something. As Iwao is pointing towards the sea, now MC says that since it's a newborn, he guesses that he's curious about everything, but he realizes that there is a ship coming towards it. By any chance, are they coming towards this island? As girl with a bunch of scary looking women are approaching towards the island, MC is shocked that by any chance they are coming towards this island, as he gets nervous, hoping they are nice people. But if they are like the female soldiers from the other day, they are done for. He tells Iwao to go back right now and protect the cavern, as he says that he will stay here and observe the ship. As a golem slowly goes out to the cavern, as the ship stops midway, they are lowering a boat, and a couple of girls have boarded the boat. MC thinks that they are all women and aren't like soldiers, but to his misfortune, they are pirates. As they land on the seashore, the captain smiles down and orders Anne Louise to tie up the board properly. Hillary and her companions are to check the location of the river they saw from the ship, and everyone else will be scouting the ship. One of her companions, namely Janice, says that it looks like a pretty nice island, and they were lucky to find a place not even marked on the charts. The captain says that it looks perfect for hiding from the navy and good enough to make it their new hideout. MC is quite delighted by the bouncy chest of hers, thinking that she surpasses Christian. But as he realizes that they have to hide from the navy, he deduces that they are pirates after all. He is scared that he really doesn't want criminals to become his neighbors. The captain orders them not to slack off, and they are going to explore. MC, in the caravan, thinks that all the fruit he can bring for his necessities while mountain hiking while carrying the spear and fishing rod is going to be a problem. Maybe he will hide the rod in the forest, as it is only a matter of time before they find this place, and he will hide in the mountain until they leave. He tells Iwa that they have to move secretly as they encounter a girl outside. The pirate shouts that there is a man, and there's a man here, making everyone charge towards her location. They appear before MC within seconds as MC shouts that they don't come any closer, and if they try, the stone golem will go berserk. One of the pirates is quite excited that it is really a man. And does that rock puppet really move as Iwa raises his fist? The companions taunt that it doesn't matter if they all beat the crap out of it, 
They can do it, and that MC is quite the catch. But they are punched down by the captain, who scolds them, saying that they are idiots and she will not allow them to assault a weak man. She apologizes to MC, saying that he can relax and they were just stopping on the island to resupply, and they will leave once they get their hands on some water and meat, and they won't let them rough him up. MC is suspicious that he is not so quick to just take her word, and he is not a former employee of a black company just now. The captain says that it helps a lot. And he must be scared, and she will make sure that they don't lay a finger on him as she departs with the companions. The brushed woman asks is addressed as Futch, and the other one is addressed as Butin. She asks if she is okay, for which she says that the scratch isn't a big deal. An attitude pisses her off, and the captain says that she is so pretentious, for which Butin says that she goes off at them for just resting up a bit like a hysterical man. Futch says that she's strong, like strong. And they can't oppose her, for which Butin says that there are rumors that she is a former navy officer of some country, and she wonders why she turned into a pirate. She says that still, that man wasn't bad, and she's dying to sit on his face and do quite a lot of things with him, for which Futch says that if someone like her did that to him, he would just break off, as she says that he looks like he would enjoy it, but he's the type to get a boner from it. MC is quite shuddering from the nervousness, as he thinks that he feels like he's being speculated about. Futch says that if the captain hadn't been pretending so much, they could have done as they like. But she's getting cocky just because her face is a little prettier. Butin says that she may not look like it, but she heard that she likes letting men have their way with her, for which Futch gets excited, asking who told her. Butin says that there was a waiter named Louise at the tavern, and she had him spill the beans when she got her hands on him before leaving port. As Futch teases, she can't believe that she is into it, and she swears that she acts all high and mighty, but on the inside, she's just like a man. Suddenly Janice comes in between, scaring them, asking them who is a pervert and just like a man, as they get scared, dodging the question, saying that it's just a little joke and they wouldn't actually think of it. Janice says that they are a bunch of idiots, and they are speaking a bit too loud. What do they think will happen if the captain hears them? But it's not like she doesn't understand how they feel. And they finally manage to get away from the Navy, and she also thinks that they shouldn't be punished if they had some fun with a man for a bit. They get delighted, saying that's it, and if they all got together and ganged up on him, it would definitely boost their morale. Janice says that she knows exactly what they mean, and don't they think the captain is a bit lacking in flexibility? Actually, she has a secret plan as they plan something. The scene shifts into the cavern as MC trains Iwao on throwing the stone, but to his surprise, the golem is simply throwing it on the ground. MC says that he was wondering if he could throw stones at long range, but his movements are way too slow and it won't work. Maybe he's designed as a tank. If so, maybe a shield instead of a weapon would be better, but it has a high cost of 56 MP in 18 hours. He thinks that his things stand this way. If he suddenly needs something else immediately, he will be in trouble, so he decides to hold this off. He makes four torches, thinking that they are more efficient than he thought. He tells Iwa that if any intruders show up, he should make sure that he stops them. He thinks that he thought they were just primarily lightning, but torches are super useful, and he manages to add two more. With that, just now, two productions have reached level 3, and the creation magic level itself is almost 4. Usually, he would be happy about this, but in this situation, he can't just get in a cheerful mood as he can't wait for the pirates to be gone at night. As MC hears a big noise, he wonders if it was an explosion and seizes towards the window. He gets nervous that the pirates did something, maybe a cannon or maybe magic. He gets armored with a pan, a knife, and a spear, thinking that he's not joking around. He just wants to improve his survival skills at the very least. He asks Iwa what is going on outside as he sees a person in the shadows and shouts, asking who it is, as a shadow emerges from the bushes. The scene shifts as the captain is sleeping. Janice shouts that it's a big trouble for her, apologizing for the late hour, but something terrible has happened. She tells her that all the companions have a disease. Janice mentions Anna and Hillary are the ones affected. Futch and Butin, as well as the captain, say that four people are a lot, and this is bad if the cause is on this island, then it will be a problem. Janice says that leaving them would be the only choice, for which the captain says that she is an idiot. And they can't just abandon them. And where are they going to snatch a doctor or healer from? Janice says that in that case, let's turn one of the cabins into a sick room and seal them off, for which the captain says that it must be rough on them. As she asks them to get on their backs, as Butte sluggishly gets on the back of the captain, but she penetrates a knife through her waist. The captain shoves her away as she gets angry, asking what's the big deal, as a person shoots a couple of fireballs towards her, for which the captain tries to dodge, but due to her injury, she is unable to dodge all of them. She says that a wind cutter is able to bypass any of her magic defenses, 
so the one who is behind it is Janice. Janice addresses her saw Cecily, as she declares they don't think that she is fit to be her captain, and she will die here. As the captain summons a big fireball, saying that they think the lights of them can defeat her, the Cecily the bursting flame. As Janice shouts that they have to get away from them, as it is a flame burst magic, as Cecily shoves a big blast in front of her, as the companions are quite injured, as Janice orders that don't attack as they will hit each other, as they are unable to find Cecily. Buten informs that she got away, for which Janice says that there is no need to chase after her as they got her good, and she will kick the bucket soon anyway, and she doesn't want to force it and get into a real fight with her, as she orders that they will return to the ship and they should tell the others that she and company got a disease. As she asks Louise and Thera they're hiding behind, as one of them says they're doing something to the captain, for Janice says that she is the captain of that ship now, and here is the first order for them to get rid of the two of them, as injured Cecily encounters MC. MC tries to stop her, asking what's her business here, for which Cecily, quite injured, asks that she knows it's coming from a pirate, but she wonders if he could help her as she faints down. As MC sees the blood fluttering up from her, he thinks that it doesn't look like an act, but if this is a trick, his purity is in danger as he thinks that whatever. He orders Iwa to give his hand and they will carry her into the caravan as they bring her into the bed. MC says that she got a wound in her thigh and her back, which Cecily says is pathetic, but her subordinates betrayed her and she let her go down, for which MC thinks that she needs to be treated quickly. Then again, what should he do as he still hasn't unlocked the medicine production? MC says that he doesn't have any medicine. Cecily mentions that right now she's putting all her magic power into the physical strength thing, as this is supposed to help wounds heal faster, and she has more magic power than the average person, and if she's lucky, she will make it. MC thinks that her wounds are horrible, but she hasn't given up. MC says he promises he will help her. Cecily apologizes for the trouble and asks for his name. MC says his name is Shiru Sonata, and this one is Iwao. First, they have to stop the bleeding in her thigh. He thinks that in order to check the wound, he will have to cut her clothes with a knife. As he investigates, the wound is over 10 centimeters long, and for its size, he feels it's not bleeding a lot. Cecily says it's thanks to the physical strengthening. Otherwise, all her blood would have flown out of her already. MC gets a torn pant, thinking that he will tie it around her thigh to stop the bleeding. He is done treating her. MC thinks this was amateurish, so he shows about being good. And he used the bandage here, so let's check back later. He gets to know that she fell asleep. Three days later, MC has made another stone golem, one for home security and the second for food gathering. He is quite delighted with this. His defense capabilities have doubled, and his creation magic has also improved. Cecily is lying down there. He thinks it's about time she woke up, but she's been sleeping the whole time. But the color is coming back to her face, and her breathing is normalized. He is quite excited looking at her beauty of fruits. Cecily is quite the beauty, and above all, her chest is quite huge. He thinks Krishna was big too, but this goes beyond it. He will just be checking when he changes the bandages. There are no wicked intentions. This is just a purely medical procedure. He thinks he can't be looking at an injured person like that, and he has to take a step back. As he shaves off, he thinks that this triple blade razor he made is something else and sharp as hell. He sees that Cecily is waking up. She's staring down at her. MC asks if she is awake, for which she gets embarrassed. She apologizes, saying that she didn't mean to peek. MC asks what she's embarrassed about, and if she gets excited all of a sudden, her wound will open. Cecily gets embarrassed, saying that it's quite bold as she falls from the bed, quite embarrassed. As Cecily is quite embarrassed, she apologizes to MC, saying that she doesn't mean to peek, and she doesn't come near him in such an unbecoming state. As MC asks what she could mean, she viciously says that she didn't think that he was taking care of her unwanted hair, for which MC realizes she means him shaving, and he guesses like a guy seeing a girl shaving her armpits. With that, he is only halfway done with his beard, for which MC says to hold on a minute as he will finish it off. As he shaves, it makes Cecily more embarrassed, and she asks him not to do it in front of a woman, for which MC says she can watch if she wants, making her more embarrassed and scream in embarrassment. MC thinks she is an innocent pirate. After some time, MC serves mango juice to her, saying that she hasn't eaten in a while, so drink it slowly, for which she thanks him. As MC helps her drink it, Cecily says that it's quite delicious and really good, she can feel it perking her body. As MC asks if it hurts, she says it does a bit when she raises her arm, for which MC says he will feed her, as injured people should listen and be obedient, for which she gets embarrassed. As MC helps her to feed, Cecily thanks him and asks for his name, as MC says that his name is Sonata, for which she smiles down, saying that it's a lovely name. MC thinks that this is the first time he heard that opinion and, in fact, is a pretty masculine name, and he has had a complex about not living up to it. He asks if she's hitting on him, which makes her shocked and embarrassed. 
She denies it, saying that she just really felt that way, as there are no ulterior motives. MC thinks her reactions are quite great, and teasing Cecily really pays off. As he asks her to lay off, Cecily says she's serious and it's the truth, and she again falls asleep. MC thinks that she must be tired from all the drinking and talking and decides that there are many things he has to make now and wonders what an injured person needs. After some time, he prepares a lot of inessential wise nursing, thinking that he will soon be at level 5, and it's a good number to stop it. So he gets the feeling that there will be no new developments like unlocking medicine production and other categories. If he makes another Iwal Golem production, he will level up to 2. And when that happens, he may be able to make a different type of golem, but he thinks that making an iwa takes 48 hours. In the end, food takes priority, so let's postpone that. He thinks that there may be pirates around, so they are leaving the fruit gathering to number 2, and he wants to go fishing outside after, on the sixth day after Cecily arrived. As Cecily says she has done eating, and MC suggests changing those bandages, for which Cecily says that actually she thinks her wound has healed and the pain is gone and it looks like it's a terrible itch as she shoves him. MC is quite having a hard time hiding his little Joe, as Cecily says that he was really a help, and she needs to thank him, as MC is quite touched, saying that no, she doesn't have to thank him, and he already promised not to do anything to him, even though she was a pirate, for which Cecily says that because it didn't look like he had anything valuable, she made it a principle not to harm the poor. And she only goes after the rich, not stealing water and food, that's an unconditional rule. And if it's money, she will have some hidden that she will share with him, or maybe there's some place he wants to go, and she can escort him there anyway. MC thinks that he was planning to stay here for a while and work on the creation magic, and he wasn't thinking of leaving this island. He grins, asking if she will take him as a husband, making Cecily fall off the bed as she curses him as an idiot, saying that it is an entry in the family register, not a place. She is quite embarrassed and hesitant, saying that if he is going to take this seriously, she will do it. She asks who would want to do that with the pirate, for which MC says that her reactions are quite hilarious, and he couldn't help it, as he was just teasing again. Cecily is angry, saying that he keeps saying things like that and she will push him down, for which MC says that she can't. MC says, well then, since he has been planning to build a canoe, teach him how to steer a boat, for which Cecily is quite happy, saying that then she will build it and teach him how to handle it, and she can't say if she repaid him if she doesn't do that much. If he lends her a knife, she will be done in her day, as Cecily asks that using physical strengthening and elemental magic, it would be really easy, for which MC asks if her body is in good shape and not to push herself. Cecily jiggles her body, asking MC to look at how healthy she is. Having MC hide his Joe MC is in the forest, he asks if the pirates are not really here, for which Cecily says that they probably have forgotten about her and left the island, and if they wanted to kill her, it would be weird for them to wait until she recovered, for which MC says that she's right, for Cecily says that they have to go to the beach, just in case. As MC is fishing down, he thinks that in order to survive in the other world, one has to be extremely cautious and paranoid at times. It's not a mistake to be afraid of an enemy he hasn't seen in six days. He thinks that it's crazy that he's fishing while guarded by two stone golems, and it's like he's a VIP. From behind, Cecily comes in, saying that she has a big, nice log, but MC is surprised that she has shoved a fully grown tree on her back. MC shouts at her, saying that she's an idiot and what if her wounds open, for which Cecily says that it's okay, as she will work on it. As she has started to burn the log, she thinks that it would be enough, as she scratches it down. MC realizes that it looks like she may really build the canoe within a day and he guesses he will have to prepare the dinner. He wishes that he could make the food just like that, but it looks like that's not possible at his level, like with onions and garlic, as he hasn't caught any. He is quite delighted to catch a fish that is a white fish, and it looks a lot like cod and even tastes like it. He thinks that he's going back to the caravan a bit. In the caravan, he makes a fillet with the fish, sprinkling it with salt and lightly coating it with flour. He then pours olive oil into the pot and adds garlic. As he is making them, he thinks that it would have tasted even better if he had white wine. Then, just before eating, add chopped tomatoes and season with salt and it is done, the nemesis soup, as he brings the pot, calling Cecily honey, saying that the dinner is ready, which makes Cecily embarrassed, asking why is he calling her honey and they are not married. As Cecily drinks down the soup, MC asks if she wants seconds, for which she agrees. As MC asks, as she is quite embarrassed, MC teases her, asking for dessert, she can have him, which makes her nose bleed, as he thinks that he went too far, as he apologizes to her, as he thinks that he has never seen anyone fall over with a bleed from excitement before and people sure are different, as he thinks that Cecily is quite innocent. After some days, as the creation magic is at level 5, MC thinks that since it's a nice number to stop it, he thought he would unlock medicine production or something. But still, there is something to be happy about as bread production specifically leveled up to 2, 
and if he keeps leveling up like that, he may be able to make it in a matter of seconds. The next day, Cecily asks if he now knows the basics, and let's go on to the sea as they sail. As they sail to the sea, MC thinks that she actually built the canoe in a day. Cecily says that the water is gone, and let's continue along the shoreline and go around the island once. As MC is sailing, he thinks that this is the first time he has gotten a good view of the island from the sea. Cecily asks if, by the way, this island has a name, for which MC asks if he is a castaway, as Cecily says that he should name it, like Shiru Sonata Island or something, for which MC denies it, saying that it's way too embarrassing, and since there is a mountain, maybe Mother Island, but denies it, saying that it's too plain. As MC thinks of Chris, he names the island Monte Chris Island, and Cecily asks who that is, for which MC says that she is not here anymore. There was something she needed to take care of, and he hopes that she is doing well. As they are sailing, MC thinks that this should be the south side of the island, and there's a lot of cliffs, for which Cecily asks that they don't get close until he gets the hang of it, as MC thinks that this is quite amazing and it looks like a secret dock. As MC says that with the water a bit calmer, he thinks that even he can hide about in there. But as she finds something strange, MC asks what's wrong. Cecily says that she thinks she saw what looked like stairs in the back of the cave. As MC is quite frightened that if they are artificial, he has been on this island for over 10 days. But he haven't seen any signs of other humans, as Cecily suggests that they will check it out and it is going to be pretty shaky as she moves the boat, as MC thinks that the deeper they go, the calmer the water gets. As Cecily makes a light with a fire, they see a stairs down with the cliff, as MC thinks that it's not a natural formation, it's clearly man-made, as Cecily helps him to debark the boat, as they are walking down the stairs. Cecily says that there are no signs of monsters or humans but keep an eye out if something happens. Stay beside her, as she's jiggling her back, MC is quite excited, as they reach onto the ground. MC looks down the cliff, he gets quite nervous holding out Cecily, as Cecily says that he is a scaredy cat and it's okay, as MC is having quite a blessed time with her, as MC says that he wonders where this is on the island, for which Cecily says that probably just south of the caravan and as thinks that he has never gone into the dense forest south of the caravan and he guess if they go right straight south they would end up here and looks like a good fishing spot so maybe he will have the golems build a path. As MC asks that can they look around the forest for a bit and there may be fruit trees, for which she agrees. As they see a path down there, MC asks what is this, as Cecily says that it will be fine but be on guard and stay behind her. As Cecily says there is something beyond the forest, as MC and Cecily are shocked to encounter a colossal gate in front of them. As MC says that he can't believe a building like this was here and as the reliefs and other details are withered but it looked like a South American rune, for which Cecily corrects that this isn't a rune, as she laughs out scaredly, saying that this is a dungeon and she have never thought she would find an untouched in a place like this. As MC asks if the dungeon if it's a place where there's a lot of monsters traps and stuff, for which Cecily says that exactly, a place of plenty of treasure too, as MC asks how she knows it's a dungeon at a glance in the first place. Cecily says that it's because of the magic it animates. MC is quite scared, saying don't tell that if they are going in, for Cecily says to relax, not even she could think about taking on a dungeon by herself, as she needs to gather allies first, and there is something she has to do before that. MC, with a scary face, thinks that maybe it's revenge, for which Cecily says that yes, they will get what is coming to them, and besides, that's her ship. MC thinks that revenge won't make Cecily happy, but if that's what it takes for her to move on, she says that first of all, she needs to build a ship in order to escape this island, to which she agrees. MC says that he will make the sailcloth, and he will get her back to the sea. MC thinks that she could build a simple boat out of the trees of the island, but he guesses she can't make a sailcloth, and a sailcloth is a must for long-distance travel. He thinks that he doesn't mind if she finds out about his creation magic, as she is kind of an earnest pirate lady, and he can't imagine she would do anything to him. Cecily says that once she gets her revenge, she can come back to this island, for which MC says that, of course, they will have toast with mango juice again, then in the sea, in front of the stairs. Cecily says that she wants to gather some companions and explore this as soon as possible, for which MC asks, but it's dangerous. Cecily says that the potential reward in the dungeon is enormous, especially if it's an untied one. MC asks, but would it be worth it if she died for it? Cecily says that he is a man after all, and a woman would risk her life for treasure. MC realizes that it has nothing to do with gender, and that's disrespectful to the man of the world. Cecily says that besides, next time, she's going to get some people she can trust, and she won't bring anyone who would try to do weird things to him. 
MC thinks that he appreciates the concern, but if it's his type of goal, he wouldn't mind if she pursues them forcefully, as he's quite fantasized thinking that he might be a coward. But he doesn't discriminate. He likes beautiful women, but he's also okay with charming ones or types he could have a good conversation with. A young, fine woman, though he also doesn't mind a less energetic lady in her 30 seconds. As Cecily says that if it's not a bother, she would be happy if he let her stay at the caravan again when the time comes, as MC agrees, saying that sure, then he will set up an inn where her party can stay, which delights Cecily as she praises that it sounds good, and she names it Shiru Inn, as she says that it's a great idea. And now she's looking forward to her return even more, and she will be paying him handsome. As MC thinks that running an inn here for people coming to this island doesn't sound bad, so let's be careful not to make it a dodgy inn with no integrity. After some days, as they have made the boat, Cecily says that it ended up taking them four days to build it, for which MC says that four days is fast enough, and with that, will she be okay with large waves and stuff? Cecily says that this is an island sea, so she won't have to deal with waves that high. And there are no strong winds this time of year, as MC thinks that this is like the Mediterranean Sea. As Cecily says, she never thought there was a man who could actually use magic. Three days earlier, Cecily asked that word, and by the way, he said that he would make a sailcloth. But how exactly will he make it as it has to be pretty durable, thick cloth? And can he even make fabrics on this island in the first place? For which MC says don't worry. He just has to take care of it, as he says that with magic he will make it appear, so please step aside. As Cecily asks that there is no way a man could use magic, is he okay? For which MC summons a big sailcloth upon her, making her struggle to breathe. MC apologized to her, as in the present, Cecily says that it surprised her, as MC says that he was surprised too. Not even the thick sailcloth could stop her chest from sticking out, as Cecily says that he even created some barrels for the water, and she can't thank him enough. As MC sees it, back then, he could only make water jugs for Chris, and they're ceramic, so they break easily, and he hopes that she's okay. 13 more EXP until level 6, as Cecily asks MC that she is done loading everything, for which MC says that lunch is almost ready with wild boar meat and a turnip soup. As they are having lunch, Cecily says that she won't be able to eat his food for a while, for which MC says that he will expand her repertoire before she comes here, as Cecily says that she can't wait. After some time, as she bids farewell, saying that farewell to Iwa 1 and Iwa 2, saying that they were quite the help, for which they raised their hand in thanks, as MC sees that she never laid a hand on it, and it was a little lonely, but he likes the seriousness of hers, as MC thinks that maybe he teased her a bit too much for today, and at least he will see her off seriously. As MC smiles down and hugs down sis, kissing her on her cheek, as Cecily is quite embarrassed, blurting out that what is he doing, for which MC says that for a spell for a safe voyage, that's as how it's done it. As Cecily says that good grief it's just one surprise after another, as she will definitely come back, as she boards the boat, as MC screams that he will create a place where both her mind and body can heal, and he and she will receive her party as well, and he will get one together and come back right away, as Cecily says that she will be the one surprising him, as she disappears in the thick sea. As MC says that these are seagulls and a flock of seagulls like birds, and please deliver this prayer on his behalf, as he prays that Chris and Cecily to be safe. As in the caravan, MC thinks that he made cooking oil and creation magic leveled up to 6, and he can have up to 309 MP now, but other than that, no changes, as he thinks that it's time to make a new golem, and he's sure it will be a bit livelier with another Iwa round as he starts golem protection, as he can only make one thing at a time, and maybe he will work out something tomorrow. The next day, as it is raining, MC thinks that in the rain, where he doesn't want to work, he can't help it, and he is planning to build a small farm, as he's making Iwa 1 and Iwa 2 make the farm. MC thinks that they are working silently in the farm, and they look quite lonely. MC thinks that golems don't have feelings, and he guesses he's the one lonely. As MC thinks that the stream was muddy due to rising water, he will have to just drink the rain water, and he will need to prepare a water tank for times like this. He can't use magic as the rain drops on the pots, which are making quite a delighted sound. MC thinks that, speaking of which, there is basically no entertainment here, maybe he will make something like playing cards, as he thinks that he's pretty sure if he can make that with the golem production, as he gets delighted that it will be a wonderful entertainment using clay. He can make artistic figures, of course, the models of Chris and Cecily. As he thinks about his fantasies, unfortunately they can't move. It looks like a very high level. He could make autonomous golems in any shape he wants, as he thinks that it's a pretty nice pastime to forget his loneliness. If it goes well, he might be able to make a cast of figures, and he can't wait for the new Iwao to be done, as he is excited. After two days, as the new Iwao is done, he is excited that the lineup is a sight to behold, as he names it Iwao number 3. 
Here is his current status, as his MC is delighted that golem production has leveled up and he can now make a new golem, and it's a different type of stone golem for me while. There is no time to make the artistic figure, and he is starting this golem right now as he asks the Iwas to rejoice as a new family member is coming. In the summers as MC is doing quite a bit of work, and at night, MC thinks that two days have really flown by when they were working on the field, and then what everyone has been waiting for as he summons a stone golem type as a small one, as MC, seeing a quite artistic golem in front of him, is excited, saying that it's pretty small rather than human-y, it's monkey-like, and if he is agile, he asks him to move as the golem did a back flick. MC says that it is quite a monkey after all, and he names it Goku. MC says that he has some agile fingers too, and then he will have him help with the delicate work that Iwao can do. Actually, he had been thinking about renovating the caravan after some days, as they had successfully made a good one and a board named Monte Chris as in Shoruin, as he thinks that it's already been a half month since Goku was created, and now they are ready for whenever Cecily comes back. As MC is done renovating the caravan, they have a window and door and two bunk beds, and he even put up a sign. He hopes it looks like a proper inn. Not just Cecily and Chris might come back too, and he guesses that the fate of the eastern garrison rests on her shoulders. From behind, Iwa number one is flickering out as MC says that he did great work and he can take a day off, but he notices that it's not moving and is scared that it might have died. He thinks that he's out of magic power, and he guesses even golems need fuel. He puts his hand on the flashing sport to install his magic to make Iwa number one fire up thinking that it sucked 50 MP out of him, and he needs to replenish their MP properly and systematically from now on. He thinks that the MP portion is for humans, and so for golems and magical devices, there is magic stone, but he can't make magic stones and wonders how he can get them. He thinks that if this were a game, as he encountered a slime, he would get them by defeating monsters, but he's scared that he can't. They purify the water and deal with all the trash. Most importantly, they are growing with his taste, and they are a part of his daily life. A part of him could say that even he feels some strange closeness with them, and it looks like they have grown used to him, and they don't mind him approaching them to the point where they swim beside him in the river. He shouts that that's why he can't go slime hunting, as the magic stones can wait for now. MC is fishing when he thinks that with the farm done. Now he has agriculture on top of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and next is livestock. He's looking up at the sky, thinking that it's the birds, but he recognizes that those are not birds but pteranodons, and they are coming this way. He hides with Goku, ordering Iwaos to stand by Cavern, fully armored. MC thinks that maybe they are looking for a place to land, and he's sure that Crescent Coast will be Crescent Coast being the most open. He thinks that probably he gets the feeling that they have already found the caravan, and if they are like the soldiers at the castle or pirates again as he gets jittery. Then again there are also decent people like Chris and Cecily, as he has to prepare himself. The riders have landed down, and one of them asks her companion Louise to be on guard, and they don't know what is luring around. She says that the wyvern is most dangerous at the moment of dismounting, and don't forget that. Louis agrees and addresses her as captain. The captain says that there are no signs of an enemy, and they should head in the direction of the field they saw from above, and if there are any people, they have to be over there. MC thinks that the wild, cool beauty captain seems to be in her late 30 seconds, and if only such a boss would spoil him. He thinks that an inexperienced Louis should be in her late teens, and she seems pleasant and kind. He thinks that the one with a slightly nasal voice is in her late 20 seconds, and she's beautiful but kind of gushy, and she's a flirt. He thinks that the three don't seem like bad people, as he rustles out as the girls get in guard. MC innocently greets them as the wyvern barely swallows him, apologizing for the surprise with the sudden visit and stating that they are a survey team from the Land Management and Surviving Institute of the Empire of Lurgoa. As she addresses herself as Captain Alyssa Milano, MC realizes that they are from the Empire of Lurgoa, the one hostile to Chris, but they seem willing to talk, so he thinks it's fine. MC introduces himself as Shiru, explaining that he lives by himself on this island. The girls are shocked that he lives alone on this isolated island, and Milano asks what's with that deal. MC can't tell them that he escaped from the prison back in the capital with Chris, so he says that he's a castaway and it happened when he was a child. Milano speculates that his clothes look pretty new considering, to which MC explains that pirates and merchant ships show up here occasionally, and he traded with those people. Milano suggests that having a man on board is bad luck, so no one rescued him, and it looks like he had a hard time. MC mentions that there's plenty of fruit and animals one could eat here. Milano then asks if a tax collector ever came here, to which MC apologizes, saying he's not really sure where this island belongs. Milano informs him that this island is the territory of the Empire of Lurgoa, and as such, he is one of its subjects. MC asks if that means from now on he is required to pay taxes, to which Lini remarks that they would lose money if they came all the way here to collect it. 
However, the captain shuts her up, saying it's for the authorities to decide. Milano then asks if there's a place where they can rest, explaining they have been on reconnaissance flights since early morning and haven't eaten. MC suggests they stop by his place, surprising them when they see Iwao, Iwao number 1, 2, and 3 on guard. MC explains that they are his golems, surprising Milano. She asks if he's not a man, to which MC says he doesn't really know why, but they listen to what he says. Milano is surprised by the welcome and asks if he even gets any customers here, to which MC replies that they are the first ones. Lini gets scolded by Milano for her comment about being his first woman, and Milano explains they are always on a mission and she hasn't seen a man in a while. She mentions her husband back at home, and MC thinks about how, in this world, the father is the one raising the children. MC serves them herbal tea, and Milano asks if they should order a meal. MC asks if they don't mind him using what he has on hand, and Milano agrees, saying if it's better than water and dried meat, they are okay with anything. MC decides to make a delightful dish, thinking that being told something like that makes him want to serve them something delicious. In the kitchen, he decides to put the kitchen he built to good use right now, welcoming his first customers at Monte Cris Island and Shiro Inn. As MC quiets down the fish, he thinks that what he caught this morning is a side dish. As for the soup, he will make it, as Lyanna is pigging down on MC and is feeling quite flirty. She thinks that the sight of a man cooking really gets her going. She thinks that he may let her hard do him if she asks Louise if she will propose to him, as this is her chance to lose her virginity. As the Milano comes in from behind and punches down Lyanna, MC thinks that he sees Louise as a virgin, but she become a wizard once she turns 30. Actually, he guesses she has been able to use magic since birth. As he serves them the white fish, seasoned with olive oil and garlic, soup with mashed potatoes is added to the dash she made from onions and white fish. Milano praises him, saying that it looks amazing, and the bread too, as they eat down the bread. As there's a sudden silence, MC asks if there is something wrong, for which the three of them scream that this is so delicious, but delicious, doesn't it do justice? As she has never had bread like this, MC thinks that reminds him of Chris, as she praised it as really good. As she said that it is on par with the food served in the royal palace, Milano asks if he made this bread and does he have a wheat field, for which MC says that a sailor sold the wheat to him and he has more bread ready if they would like, for which they abruptly agree to it. As Lyanna, after the lunch proposes MC's asking if he would marry her, for which MC says that yes, yes, maybe next time, as Lyanna gets irritated, saying that she's serious, for which MC says that he she's hitting on every guy she sees, for which Lyanna agrees and he's special. And he's a good cook and easy to boot, as MC says that he's flattered but he likes sincere people like Louise, making Louise steam in embarrassment. As Milano asks that, by the way, proprietor, as she's referring to him as a kami, a term used for a woman running in it. As Milano says that they spotted a building resembling a rune to the south of the inn and what is this, as MC thinks that he don't think they could see that too, as Milano says that they will go and investigate the runes as they bid farewell. As MC apologizes to Cecily, they just found out, and he can't keep it hidden from them. He got 100 layman copper coins, and he thinks that this time the meal was 500 layman per person, and he hadn't thought about the setting of a price, so it was a big help that they told him what the market rate is, as he thinks that it turns out that the three of them will be staying in the night here too and they are his first customers and he needs to be serious about entertaining them, as he decided that in which case cancelling the Iwa Great Shield current production and he just wasted 160 MP, but it is what it is, and right now there's something he wants to make that takes the higher priority as he orders the number Iwa number 1 and number 2 to clear the area along the river and lay down some flat stones, and Goku and number 3 build a kato, a stone kato for heating up water, and do their best, everyone, and show him a never-before-seen scenery. The scene shifts as at night Milano and her companions are back as MC welcomes them, saying that if they found something interesting, for which Milano says that they did, it would be as though runes are the entrance of a dungeon. As Louise mentions, they will be rewarded for the discovery. Lina adds that ancient ruins are reputed to be full of treasure. MC agrees that it's good to hear and suggests they must be tired, welcoming them to the bath. When they ask if there's a stone bath there, MC confirms it has been there all along and expresses his excitement at the opportunity to see multiple bodies in the flesh. As they take in the bath, Lina focuses on the bath, expressing her surprise at being able to bathe in a place like this. Milano adds that it's been three months since she last bathed in the public bathhouse in the imperial capital. Louise notices that the water smells really nice, and Milano explains that they added not only petals but herbs too. MC thinks Louise looks slimmer when dressed and asks about the temperature, to which Milano responds that it feels just right and is leaving her body feeling wonderful. Lina then boldly asks MC if he would wash her back and even her whole body. He mentions that he prepared a meal for them, which annoys Lina as she screams that he is mean to only her, but MC thinks that he would have been tempted if the other two weren't there. 
Despite his thoughts, he knows he needs to watch his actions carefully. As he thinks if this were his previous world, he would have been detained. He is pleased that his eyes are now blessed. As he enters the private room after 15 minutes, he finishes washing his clothes after doing that thing as he gets prepared to get dinner. The scene shifts in the night as MC is lying down in his bed, thinking that dinner is over and everyone has gone to bed. He's just lying down. But, to be completely honest, he's waiting for someone to sneak into his room. He knew that he shouldn't have gone exploring around the bath, but he can't calm down. He will go ahead and say that he wouldn't mind the three of them at once. The next day, as MC enters the room and sees the two of them sleeping, he finds them cute. He realizes that in the end, no one showed up, and Lina even peeped at him in the bath. As he goes out, saying that he will wash his face, he sees Milano out there as he greets her. As she greets him back, she says that it looks like they will have favorable conditions for flying today. MC asks if they are returning to the Empire already, for which Milano says that yes, discovering a dungeon is a given top priority, and she might be able to be home before the day is over. MC says that she must be looking forward to seeing her son for such a long time, as Milano says that she needs to make her existence known once in a while, as she's afraid that he will forget his mother's face. As she asks about the future, MC is shocked to hear that there is a survey team of 100, as MC asks if that many. He only has a capacity of four, for which Milano says that he doesn't have to worry about that, as the soldiers will make a camp, though there are some officers as well who may wish for meals, for which MC informs them that he can only make things like what he served them yesterday, for which Milano says that it's enough. The dish would satisfy even the most discerning of senior officers, initially, she is one of them, as she's a knight. As MC delights in a female knight of another world, he guesses dragon riders are elite. As MC thinks, that means Leanne is an elite too, but she's also flirty and brilliant, as MC says, he will make preparations and welcome them, for which Milano asks that it's hard to say about him as she's quite worried about something. In the cavern, as MC serves the mango mushrooms, bread, eggs, and coffee with them, they are delighted that the breakfast looks great. As MC thinks, it looks like they have quite a long fight flight ahead of them and they need them to be well fed. Lina asks if he has any more sausages, and the three of them ask for coffee and bread, for which MC thinks that it looks like he was worrying over nothing after some time. As Milano asks MC how much for the lodging, she says that for a night with two meals, she would say around 4,000 to 6,000 laymen, and even for 6,000, she would become a regular herself. As MC asks how 5,000 laymen per person sounds, Milano says that 5,000 is a bargain for that kind of service. As Louise asks the captain, could she lend her a 1,000 laymen as she doesn't have enough and she does have magic stones? Milano says that they are magic crystals found inside monsters' bodies and they are a source of energy for magic items in the imperial capital. They double as many as their grandparents, depending on their size. As MC says that in that case, he doesn't mind accepting payment in magic stones, as Louise then offers three 1,000 layman copper coins and two tri stones as she drops them on MC's hand. A sudden status scene appears on him of the condition met of medicine production and magical devices. MC is scared that coming into contact with magic stones was the prerequisite for medicine production. And not only that, but magical device production showed up too. He holds down Louise, saying that this helps a lot, which makes Leanne jealous as she says that it's not fair and she will pay in magic stones. MC says that either way is fine, as he was just happy because it was his first time seeing magic stones. Leanne asks if he won't hold her hand, for which MC holds her hand, saying that if it's just holding hands, he will do it all if she wants, which makes Lyanna happy. As MC gives Milano a cloth, saying that it is the souvenir, Lina becomes jealous, saying that it is only for the captain, for which MC says that it's for her family, mangoes and bananas from this island, and also three beautiful and rare seashells, and please give it to her son if she would like. As the three of them barred their dragon, saying that this is a nice souvenir as they flight out, as MC thinks that alright, he orders Goku and Iweas that they are going to be busy from now on and get another Goku ready right now. He thinks that once the survey team arrives, they will be short on golem power, and he wants to make a few more golems. It might be good to keep them popping out golems in succession. But he also has to think about securing food, and he won't be able to use creation magic in the meantime. As he is fishing, he thinks that maybe he should capture a goat for the sake of food security, and he could make milk with magic, but sometimes there is a situation like this the next day. As MC orders Iwa that he wants them guys to open up part of the runes south of here and orders Goku to collect the food, he is sure that it will also be handy for the survey team to have a clear path to the dungeon from Cavern, as there is no doubt they will be grateful. As MC thinks that he will be honest, he wants to be fond over. As the captain told him that was the day they departed, Milano asked him to be careful as many of the soldiers coming are young women, as she was sure that some of them would make moves on him, similarly to Lyanna. As MC grits his fist, 
thinking they're come on, and he won't run as he's quite excited to take them on. Moana warns that he has too many openings, and he noticed Lyanna peeping at Bath at him. Moana says that it will drive the younglings crazy, keep his golems close at all times, and build a wall around the bath, as he thinks that, but he is starting to get a kick out of being watched, and let's make a peephole in the wall. Thoughtful design is the selling point in the buildings, as MC thinks that there are 100 girls, and taking into account how picky he is, he estimates there would be 40 who are his type, and he wants to be loved by all of them as he giggles down his own fantasy, making Golem Goku quite excited too. As MC is making all kinds of things these days, as he planted the roots of the onions and built the baths for the women, after some days, as he has created three Goku, he thinks that with the three of them, the production level is now three, as he has now summoned a golem horse too. As he thinks that he can even make horses now, it is much easier to move and to aid road development for fishers. He also built a log cabin with a smokehouse, and he also made a lot of seasoning and expanded his culinary dishes. As he fishes down, he thinks the preparations to welcome the survey team are steadily underway, and it has already been ten days since Captain Milano and company left the island, as he thinks. Speaking of which, when the survey team will arrive, as he sees into the sky, he sees a W van as he thinks that there is one, and who is it, Captain Louise or Milano? As he hides down, he thinks that he would prefer Louise, if possible, maybe it's a different girl, but as he is unfortunate to encounter Lyanna, thanking him for coming out to greet him, MC is quite disappointed that she showed up. Lyanna hugged him, saying that he had been the only thing on her mind. As Leanne arrives, she tells MC that she has the letter from the Empire, and that this is a present for him from her, suggesting he could use it as a rag or something if he doesn't like it. MC is given underwear, which excites him. After some days, MC is lying on the chair as Goku fans him. He thinks that Leanne stopped by to hand over the letter, and it has been over half a month since then. It looks like the survey team will come by ship, but they are yet to arrive. He pats a dog, thinking that he is leaving the afternoon patrol for them. During this time, creation magic reached level 9 and he had become able to make hound-type metal golems. They were able to capture a female goat thanks to the teamwork between Iwao and Goku, and now they have a stable supply of milk. As he sips down the drink, he thinks that at the cafe, he can have them whenever he wants, but well, they turn into a pretty big family. The current golem lineup consists of five Iwao golems, two horses named Silver, two horned dogs named Wonders, and six Goku golems. MC thinks that nothing beats spending a hot afternoon lazing around and iced coffee and Leanne with condensed milk are the best. He's quite nervous about the survey team's captain. What was her name? It was like Lot Graham, and she's a young lady from a noble family in her early 20 seconds who became an officer through her parents' connections. He hopes that she's not a harsh person. As he hears a sound, he asks if they found some prey and reminds them not to overhunt. As he hears a sound from the beach, he rides down Silver to see a ship, delighted that it's finally here. There should be a bunch of lovely women in there, maybe even his beautiful girlfriend, and he can see a rosy future just beyond the horizon. He dashes towards the stone bath to take a quick bath, and then boards down from the cliff to see a lot of soldiers. They arrived while he was getting ready, with armor too. He thinks that there is no doubt they are imperial soldiers, but after getting over the trauma of the past, he's scared. As he gets a little nauseous, he thinks he is alright, realizing that the event did traumatize him in the end, and he needs Chris to comfort him. As after Chris arrived in Bawanda Citadel, she took command of troops there, and it seems like the Empire is struggling greatly. Now he is supposed to entertain the Emperor's soldiers, and he has mixed feelings. A big woman enters the seashore, and MC thinks she is tall and comes off as a very reliable person. Is she an officer, and could it be that she is Lot Graham Sama? MC welcomes her to Monty Island, introducing himself as a local and thanking her as the captain and the officer. Beside her, MC sees a cute girl, and seeing her, MC thinks, why, what do we have here? A tiny, chubby girl appears from behind, about 150 centimeters tall, and it wouldn't be correct to call her fat, but she's fairly plump. MC is delighted that it's fine, as far as he's concerned, both chubby and slim are okay. Is she Grama's attendant? The girl says that if he's Sonata, she has received the report from Milano. She introduces the chubby girl as the survey team's captain, she's Lot Graham, and she requests that MC show her respect. MC is shocked to hear this. The girl introduces herself as Diana Lane, her adjutant. Lot is tired, and if he lets her rest in the inn as MC introduces himself and says that it's a pleasure to meet them. Lot looks away, saying that yes, as MC thinks that rather than arrogance towards a commoner, this feels like she is simply shy. As MC boards them into the carriage, Diana says that there are mentions of the golems in the report but thinks he even set up an area for the encampment, and it looks like they will have it fairly easily. MC thinks that he thought she was bad with men or just awkward, but considering her upbringing, she just may be anxious about coming to an isolated area. 
As MC thinks, well, that's kind of cute. As MC directs them towards the inn, he serves them towels, which he asks them to use to wipe the sweat off. They are surprised at that. Towels aren't a thing in the Empire, as MC directs them on how to do it. Diana and her companions are delighted that this is a pleasant sensation, and it's like the sweat is gone. MC asks them to help themselves with the beverage and is an ice cafe as he serves them to use gum. As Lot drinks it, MC asks if she would like to have more, for which she smiles to say that it's delicious and for other serving. MC thinks that she finally wants something other than yes, and food must be the way to go with her. As Diana asks how he procured the ice just by himself, MC answers that it was provided by sailors who had come to this island before, and he has been storing it in the cellar. As one of her companions asks, she will make as much as she needs, as MC appreciates it, and could he request with his help when he has the movement in the kitchen. As MC thinks that the officer left a pretty good impression and things are looking good, and there are several among the soldiers he likes to, and thanks to all the preparations he made, creation magic has leveled up to 10, and he is now able to make a bird-type wood golem primarily for reconnaissance he looks like for prey and deliver letters like a carrier pigeon as he decides to name it Coco. As he thinks that armament production is the ability to make weapons and arms that exist in his former world not only small arms but chemical biological and nuclear weapons too and rear is the ability to restore anything whether it's a broken plate or a fancy watch and he can completely restore even a car reduce it to scrap but it requires a fair amount of MP so in practice it's not like he can make or repair everything at will and this one definitely fits him better. As he decides that he has chosen to live a peaceful quiet life despite the repairing, he needs to use things carefully in the end. The scene shifts as one of the ladies says that she can't believe a man like Hod is on this kind of island, for which Diana says to not lay a finger on that man as he's an important collaborator and make sure the soldiers know that too, for which the girl says that with that said, there is no problem if he consents, isn't it, as she's quite excited. Diana warns that she won't get in the way of love, but if it interferes with her duties, she will be punished. She asks if that will be acceptable, and Lot says that she approves it as yes. 